uh, these these have helped a lot. So did you guys, okay, so we uh, we read chapters four through six. Uh, we found out that he wanted to be, a, I'm going to try to do my best to summarize this as quickly as I can. There's a lot here, obviously. I think even more next week, me and Jessica were already talking about that. Um, he wanted to be a sports writer and covered basketball and football during his time as a reporter at UCLA. Um, he talked about covering John Wooden and the last lecture series, which was a great emphasis on the idea of legacy and what we want to be known for as leaders, something you guys know I talk about. Uh, he met his wife at UCLA as well. It was an interesting parallel with some of the political protests that were going on at the time that we now have, of course, going on in the Dar world too. Um, he was disappointed by not getting the ambassadorship to India, but then interestingly enough, his life would have been completely different because a week later he gets a call to work at Disney that he would never have gotten. So one of those like sometimes one door shuts, one door opens kind of thing. So let's keep that in mind as we're going out there our day to day. Uh, when they bought, when they were, um, when they brought pictures of the animators and talked about making them into the icons so that the company could be more than just Walt Disney, he, Disney himself didn't really like this idea because he wanted to have like the brand that he spent years building be about the Disney brand. And I thought that was a very interesting idea and kind of something we still talk about. The Disney brand is what we want rather than like one individual. We're not Iger company. We're not the Disney company. We're a brand of Disney. I, I, I still think that carries on to this day. Um, let's see. Uh, Walt met, met with Marty and his boss at a coffee house right there on Main Street. I thought that was kind of cool that they actually used Main Street Coffee House to meet. And they talked about him um, becoming something um, relating to their Imagineers. Basically, he was like a, somebody who helped um, uh, write down and solidify their ideas. Eventually, he would, of course, become an, an Imagineer. Um, some of the, and then I, I liked the story they talked about. Some of the pirates were modeled off of the churchgoers that Blaine Gibson uh, had seen in his church. And um, one of the sculptors, um, was was a, one of the sculptures was of Disney, and then Herb Dickens Ryman story of the map of Disney. So Herb Dickens Ryman is his sole name had this map that he was going to draw for Disney for the proposal for the Disney that Roy was going to take to um, Bank of America on Monday for this meeting, and he called him on Friday and said, "Hey, would you mind coming over here?" And he said, "Yeah, what's up?" And he didn't really work for the company at the time. He said, "Hey, would you mind drawing me a map?" And he said, oh my God, no, of course not. Like, that's too much work to do. It has to be done by Sunday night. And he said, yep, Sunday night. So they spent the, I think it's called, I believe it's called the Lost Weekend, if I'm wrong about that. Yep. Yeah, the Lost Weekend. And they spend the whole weekend just doing this map. And um, I, I'm sure going through many, many stages of map. And uh, it must have been good enough because obviously uh, that's how Disney was created, uh, um, which is kind of an interesting story from Herb Dickens rhyming. Lots of interesting names here. Uh, they talked about the Renaissance man, John Henge. And it, I didn't know this at all. Initially, uh, WED was a separate company from Disney, and the monorail and train were not owned by the park either. And eventually, I guess, were um, given to Disney or sold to Disney. Uh, they were owned by the Disney family. So that was not really like one of those, uh, you know, just so you know. Oh, my God, I have a thousand... Um, Thousand quotes, but I'll just give my uh, favorite one here. To start I mean, there's, there's so many. Um, the, the John Wooden one um, is the one I'll give because I've, I've heard it in very many different ways, but it's really good. Uh, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. So if you're going to not take the time to, to prepare, you're automatically pretty much setting yourself up for failure. Um, great quote. John Wooden, of course, is one of the greatest basketball coaches that's ever lived, and he. Um, he definitely had some great uh, influence on Marty because uh, he wrote and uh, wrote the sports column while he was uh, there. Um, let's go over to Jesse, and I'll stop the share. <laughs> Unless you want that. <laughs> I mean, sure. <laughs> um, okay, so this week I was going to do the sign for like wear a mask. Um, so there's two ways you can do it. You can just take your whole hand and kind of cover your face. That's a mask. Um, or you can do kind of two, I guess, C shapes. And you go from your nose out to your ears. Those are kind of the two ways that you would sign mask oh. or mask. Yeah. Um, and then we also learned, sticking with the coronavirus stuff, um, like separate or give space. Um, you can have your two people separate them. 
you can just find separate. Um, those are kind of the two best ways I would do that. So those are your two songs for this week. Um, uh, I was uh, telling Patrick earlier that this book really just, it starts out kind of slow. You're learning about his family. And it's shorter chapters and all of a sudden it's like, bam, have some information, which is <laughs> I love. It. Um, bam, I love that. I know. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> chapter four, um, I really liked the quote from Coach Wooden, um, don't let making a living prevent you from making a life. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked that quote. Uh, at Disney, we don't, we're not there for the money. We're there for the passion. So I think that adds to a lot of that. <laughs> um, so I, that just kind of stuck out to me. And then, um, sorry, I'm trying to find all my notes. Um, for chapter, oh yeah, chapter five, I liked, here's the rule. No one's expected to have all the answers. If you are asked a question and do not know the answer, just say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And when you do, never fail to pass along the correct information. You can never tell who the elephant in the room may be because elephants just don't forget. Um, I talked to Teresa about this the first time I read it through. That reminds me of Teresa. She always, um, if she doesn't know, she'll find the answer and then come back and let us know what it is. Sometimes it'll take a little bit of time because your life is insane. Um, but you always try and make it <laughs> back, which I have an eye and I think it's so great. Thank you. I don't want to be an elephant. I love elephants, but I no. don't want to be an elephant. You're not an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> and then chapter six, I really liked the concept of him describing how, like, the fact that his life would have been completely different if he went on that trip. Um, for me, even within the company, I um, actually auditioned to be in Savi's workshop, um, and I didn't get it. And at the time, I was really wanting a change. I was like, oh, that's a new land, a new experience. I could do something different. That's really exciting. Um, and then I didn't get it, and I was really bummed. And I, they never came back and told me why. Um, yeah. And so it was just – and Tyler Garcia also auditioned with me, and he didn't get it either, and he didn't find out why. But if I had gone to Savi's, I would have had a completely different path within the company. Um, and I'm really happy where I'm at and I love the team. And so it worked out how it should have worked out. But at the time I was kind of bummed about it because I was ready for a switch. So it, it really is mm. crazy how life works out the way that it's meant to. Yeah, I love that. That's great. I mean, I think probably each and every one of us has had that experience in some way or another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, we can probably just leave ourselves on mute unless you're having lots of background noise because we have a really small group today. We might even be able to just talk about the book a little more. Um, Gigi, we'll go with you next. Okay. Um, like Jesse mentioned, there's so much that went on in these three chapters. Um, what I liked about the most is how he talked about um, Coach Wooden and how he had a lot of good um, – pieces of advice. One of them was being the failure to prepare is preparing to fail. And then he mentioned in his book after he had passed um, his most, I guess, favorite, um, be quick, but don't hurry. Uh, don't let making a living prevent you from making a life. Be true to yourself. And of course, make each day your masterpiece. I thought that one was very poignant. You know, like you think like, okay, you know, I'm just going to go to work or I'm just going to live my life. But if you make each moment your masterpiece, you know, like you're just, you know, always going to be improving and always going to be doing your best. So I thought that was really good. He also mentioned of how um, the coach was, all he cared about was his players and how um, he mentioned like one of the most popular players and how all these, you know, reporters we're ask, like preparing these questions to ask him on um, how he's going to be like, how he's going to improve, how he's going to, his career is going to go. And when you're a college kid, that can be overwhelming. So one of the things the coach focused on was his well-being, his mental well-being. Like, he, you know what, like, we're not expecting you to ha be incredibly godlike from the get-go. You know, it's important that you understand, you know, you know, it's okay. You know, like, be you, be you, and we're not expecting the impossible from you. So that that was, I think, m like, one of the important things of Marty and how he built his career and how he lived his life in the professional life because of the coach, 
even though he, it wasn't his coach technically, he was just a reporter, he learned a lot from him. So I thought that was like the best part of, that, of chapter four. Um, chapter five, um, like I put, there's so many post-its I started minimizing how many post-its <laughs> I have because oh my God. I'm getting out of post-its. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, look, it looks like now. I know what you mean. I'm one big post-it. Look. <laughs> it's just, like, I don't even remember because it was just a lot of great pieces of information. And then um, I liked how on Chapter 6, Walt was asked if he was interested in being a mayor. And he's like, why, do, why would I want to be the mayor of Los Angeles? I'm the king of Disneyland. Like, <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah. Know your strength. Know your strength. <laughs> so it's just a lot of information and so much that Walt Disney, like these Renaissance men were, happened to be Renaissance men because of Walt. You know, he knew the talent, the potential, not like, oh, well, you know, as an engineer, stick to this, as a reporter, stick to this. Instead, you know, he got someone to design a lot of his rides that didn't have an engineering degree, you know, and then Marty as well. He was, he was a writer, but he made, played an important role in Disneyland. So like, and, you know, after, like, I think it was in chapter six where um, Marty was given an assignment and Walt was there and he's like, do you want to do something more? Or is that something that you want to do? And he's like, well, you know, you know, if I could do something more, that that would be great. And Walt gave him a more important role a couple months later. So he was a man of his word. You know, if he saw that potential in development, he gave you that opportunity to develop and to improve. So I yeah, I, uh, I don't know if it was the one you're talking about, but Marty has like the le uh, lessons from the, the leaders. And he says, Walt's lesson was that you don't pigeonhole anybody. You never know what a talented person can do if you never give them a chance. And, like, none of those guys were engineers. Like, very or very few of them, they were, like, they were reporters and had, like, BAs and <laughs> that could never happen. <laughs> yeah, it could probably never happen now, but, uh, my God, like, it, it did happen then, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Tamara, welcome. Hi. Hi, Tam. Hi. Hi. Hey guys, so um, had an eventful week, so didn't get a lot of reading done. Um, Teresa knows this, but now that everything's kind of copacetic and cleared, uh, Ron had a mini stroke. Yeah. So um, we've been dealing with that for this past week in the emergency room and all that stuff. So not a lot of time to read, but um, I will say that just the first couple chapters that I did get to read, when you talk about pigeonholing, Judy and Patrick, it's why can't we still be that way? I mean, it resonated with me when he talks about the scariest thing is a blank piece of paper. And I'm just going to go back to the first couple chapters because I missed last week. Um, but it's just, do you... Fear being the first person to make a mark on that blank piece of paper? Or are you excited because you get to be the first person to make the mark? And I think when we walk around our areas, and we, especially when we go back, this is going to be a perfect opportunity to apply that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. Of not pigeonholing ourselves into what we used to do or what we should be doing, but what can we do? And, you know, accept all those ideas and those thoughts from everybody that we're going to be working with. So, you know. yeah. Yeah, that's and, and the fact question, that he, right? you know, why, why couldn't we, uh, you know, like when you get into management, you guys all know this, that are managers, but they don't necessarily mm -hmm. keep you in the area of expertise. And it's kind of interesting. Why, why can't we be imaginary? Tell us, tell us why, Teresa. Why can't we be imaginary? <laughs> Hello. First off, uh, Tam, when you said you were at um, Partners, I wasn't sure if you were going to pop on. So I did tell this group about Ron, but let them know that yeah. uh, you're watching him closely and he's okay. Yes. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. We got um, Yeah, for sure. It, uh, I don't, you know, things are just, um, 
I think we get in our own way. I think that's it. I think in leadership, sometimes in our daily role, we're very much cut off, um, caught up in like the task of the day, which is, you know, being with our guests and getting through the day, making sure everything runs efficient um, and not, not making the priority, the spending it with the people. And this certainly isn't every day. And it certainly, you know, isn't, um, that doesn't mean that that isn't what we want to be doing. I think it's just the nature of the business. I mean, we, we they didn't worry about labor as much <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that, right? True. right? Um, we weren't yeah. so big. And I think um, like other areas of the company, uh, the way when we make money, we make money for the whole company. And for this past like couple of years, Disneyland has really been making money for the studios where in the past it's been like the studios has been kind of holding us up. So I think we just get in our own way. But it's just a good reminder that, when we do have opportunity and time to think about, you know, our roles as leaders before um, operators almost, right? A um, couple things. When, when Marty's talking about um, my last lecture, the fellow that he said, he talks about, I had yet another connection that Professor Randy, and I apologize, I think it's Pausch is his last name. I worked as a consultant at Walt Disney Imagineering. Randy actually wrote a book called uh, my, the last lecture and I it's in a box somewhere so I'll probably get another copy and just keep it at my desk if you guys want to read it but it's really good mm -hmm. I think like Randy Randy wrote it when he landed up finding out he had cancer or some darn thing I can't remember the story behind it but it's a really good book um, but every single thing oh go ahead um, I totally forgot to say this in my group oh. um, I interpreted a 10 minute segment on Oprah of his um, speech and so I have it if you guys oh. want it it's like a truncated version of the last lecture that he did because that's an hour and 44 minutes. So if you don't have the time to devote to that, his short version is really good. I have the clip. I can email it to you guys. That's it's great. only about 10 minutes long and it's a really good listen. Um, it, he's amazing. Like I, I'm going to look at that book now because. I would love that. Yeah. That's so I can awesome, Jesse. Email it. Um, I can like forward it through the book club meeting so everyone can have it. Perfect. I totally so when, you, it, so. <laughs> when you interpreted it, do you put it on like YouTube or something for folks to, to watch or what was it no, for? I just did it. It was for school. So I got a degree oh. in interpreting. Um, so we would have like videos and then you would interpret it. So that was interpreting from voice to sign. And so sometimes you'd have sign videos, uh -huh. you'd interpret it to voice. Mm -hmm. um, it was just practice. Um, that, that was a tough one because he talks really fast because he only has oh. 10 minutes to do this whole thing um so i don't even know if i still have the clip but um we just did it for school that's cool so yeah, that's heavy subject good for you mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like interpreting a shopping list or something like that right <laughs> it's something it, was, it was a challenge but it yeah was, it's an amazing clip so i'll send it to you guys that's cool and then the other couple things because i mean every single page i have marked up highlighted and stuff was <laughs> definitely what you guys were talking about um about walt picking um, X, you know, to write for Pirates of the Caribbean. And X is like, what are you talking about? I've never written a script. Um, and it was Walt's ability to understand his, the people that he works with, and they didn't have to come with the fancy degrees. And he didn't care, you know, what their religion was or, you know, color their skin, any of that. It was all about the person and he could see people's potential. But I think he really taking the time to get to know people erased all of the misconceptions that come, you know, uh, that come into companies when you don't know your people and you start to, to categorize um, uh, them in ways that, you know, aren't accurate. And I love, you know, that when Marty talked about the fact that there was never an issue with Jewish people being in the company, that kind of a thing, that reminded me, I know mm -hmm. Disney was one of the first companies um, to offer uh, benefits for partners. Um, and that was, God, I think that was back in the 80s. It was like us and us and actually, I think it was, was it Apple or I don't know. Anyhow, there was like two companies, Disney and then another company were the first two to actually offer uh, medical benefits for partners who were in the, in the company. So I think that was amazing that his, his ability to, to see people's um, potential, even if it wasn't what they anticipated. So um, I love that part where he talked about X, but then he also goes even deeper into what we all know as, as plussing, right? So when, um, when Walt says, let's see, but Walt X replied, I've never written a script. Next, not only became the author of Lines Later Spoken by Johnny Depp, 
Um, he also was a songwriter when Walt liked his idea for a tune the Buccaneers would sing Yo Ho Ho. But then X said um, that the song was too long and Walt's like, no, 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 no. Think of it this way. It's like a cocktail party. You hear bits and pieces of conversation and you get the idea of what's going on. Our boat ride is even better if you want to hear the rest of the conversation and come back for another ride. So I love that. Come back. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Disneyland yeah. is never finished. Even if our attraction mm -hmm. is finished, for the guest, it's never finished. And then he talks about it again with the souvenir guide later in that yeah. same chapter. Right? With the cost of printing was 24 cents. We only sold them for 25 cents. And I swear to God, I want to send this to everybody where it says, uh, Walt's reasons were clear and direct. Look, we don't have to make a profit on every line of merchandise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our guests take those Scooby books home, put them on the coffee tables. Their friends see them and think this place looks like fun. And when they come, they buy tickets to the park and food and merchant side. That's when we'll make our profit. Keep the price at 25 cents as one. I want as many Subi books as you can sell in homes across the country and around the world. Um, so he's just always thinking one step ahead, which I think is what keeps us being creative, right? Trying to get out of that day-to-day -day checklist, right? Ah, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. But I think... Um, you know, for us, because we have a lot of expectations put on us, that it is definitely up to us to allow ourselves to be in that mode of thinking, even if it's just an hour a day. Say, all right, I'm going on stage. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to get to know some people. <laughs> so yeah. um, it's inspirational. That's a, good, that's a really good point, Teresa. Allow ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. you do get caught up in the, no, I got to go administer this. I got to go take care mm -hmm. of this. The I have 12 more attendances to, oh, to yeah. administer. Oh, <laughs> it's like I almost want to block in a, like a half 30 minutes on my calendar every day to say, go be creative. Mm. Yeah. Dang, why don't we do that? Yeah. Like, let's you put it on our schedule actually. for goodness yeah. sake. Yep. You should call it plusing. <laughs> yes. Plusing. Yes. This is your plusing time. Go. Yeah. Go meander, go do. That, that was the biggest thing I took away from this whole thing was like, that's a good leader when you plus an idea, not when you like, oh, I have a totally different idea or I don't like your idea, but like plus an idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think these chapters are really revealing that a lot of times it wasn't easy to work with Walt, but mm -hmm. these people were crazy dedicated to him. And, mm -hmm. you know, he just kind of called it as it was. And that one guy who said that, um, he says, Walt said I wasn't creative, and so he went home and made a model and brought it into oh Walt's office. I was like, Pizza. you know? Oh. At least give you an E for effort. Awesome. Give you an S for ish. <laughs> like, quit trying to do this, you know? Um, it was, it was it's, also it's such a kiss, kiss butt move, though, too. I was yes, like, totally. And Walt did yeah, not like much. kiss butt no, moves. He really. <laughs> <laughs> just showed how much trust that he instilled in his people and then they returned it to him so he really created that relationship so that he could be cold or not give the feedback that they necessarily want mm -hmm. but they're still going to work as hard as ever because they know yeah. what a visionary he is and how much faith and trust that he put into these people so yeah. cool. yeah. i forget Creative. which chapter it was um i think it was the the guy he got to um design the the map um or i forget what it was but they asked well, but i don't know how to do this and, they, and walt's like listen just create something that an audience will like you know just put yourself yeah. in the consume or you know the audience like if they're gonna like it it's gonna be successful and i thought that was a great idea because we we can design all the things that we want to design and create all the merchandise that we think people would want to buy, but if we don't put ourselves in that shoe, in those shoes, if you don't see ourselves as consumers, we're not going to know what consumers want, you know? So I thought that was yeah, really but important. But doesn't that, that kind of go back, yeah. Judy, doesn't that go back to our thoughts of if we think it's ugly, the guests are going to buy it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much, because there have been so many items, they're like, Who's gonna buy this? Oh, ten people just bought this. Well, never mind. Yeah. So, like, yeah. I, I think uh, I think many of us have been <laughs> in the Walt Disney Museum where you like can listen to some of the um some of these people that that were drawing for him and uh -huh. doing the designs for the movies talk about how he's like going through and just doing the storyboard. And I think for him, finding those moments and that drama that would like really capture an audience was just something easy. So when he just like, well, find something the audience would like. It's like, well, for you, that's easy, Walt. But for the rest of us, yeah. oh my God, we're, yeah. 
We're working on it, buddy. Maybe That's you, true. You, Lifelong journey. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. I, I wish I knew what that was, Walt. Tell me. Yeah. I wish but I didn't need so much challenge. sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Because I think like Walt was, he was, I think he slept a lot less than I sleep, you know? <laughs> with Iger, yes. Iger gets up so early and he gets so much done. Like, I don't, I need at least eight hours. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I love the stories. And I've shared with some of you, my aunt Edna, she would talk about how he would come out and he looked so frumpy because he'd get up in the morning and come to Aunt Jemima's for breakfast. And he'd just have this wrinkled old cardigan on. And his hair was fairly <laughs> brushed. And he was standing in the queue listening to people. Mm-hmm. But it was just like, yeah. I don't know when he slept. Yeah. Not at all. What did you guys think of when um, when uh, Marty like tried to like um, um, not give an answer that he fully knew about? And then, yes! Like, they, I highlighted that. I was like, like oh, oh my. I'm just, I'm just not going to say anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll get back to you, Walt. That's going to be my answer. No, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and then a year later, Walt's like, that's not the answer yeah. you gave me. <laughs> a year later. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I have not read that, but now I will go look for it. Oh, it's so good. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then did you guys know that we didn't own the train or the monorail, like, as a company until yes. we bought some red? You yes. Know, of course, you knew that because you read the book. But, I mean, before that? I yeah. Yeah. It's weird. We didn't own a lot, and we had a ton more leases. When we first opened, Emporium was a leasee. Wow. We didn't own a lot. But, uh, what was it called? Rugg- Ruggles or something like that, I think, was the company that owned it. That's how Walt got, you know, the park open when he didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. I know um, we didn't own the uh, lingerie shop. <laughs> well, there's a, if you ever want to, Patrick, if you ever want to learn about the trains, talk to Kathy Thorson. Okay. Yes. Kathy, Kathy Clark's family, she, the reason she got the job here is because one of the steam engines, her family runs a steam engine park up in Northern California. Whoa, so cool. she was brought in because she knew the WED and all of that and all the guidelines and all the rules. When I first hired in, it was still owned by WED. Um, that was, it was one of the few attractions that were still not a hundred percent this year. It was already in the process of being moved over, but it wasn't a hundred percent. Well, because it was sometime in the late eighties or something, right? Or nineties? I'm not sure exactly. Oh, late nineties. Yeah, oh, late nineties. There you go. Yeah, it's just crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, this is such a good book, though. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. Yeah, there's so much history that we don't necessarily know because it it wasn't necessarily in the media that often mm-hmm. growing up, at least for me. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to learn about these cool things about a company that I love that I had no idea um, yeah. that it even happened. Um, watching the Imagineering story on Disney Plus, that has been so mm-hmm. much fun. I watched it after I read the book the first time. And so I was like, I was talking to my mom, like, oh my gosh, that's him. Like, I just read his book or, oh yeah, I learned this and <laughs> a little bit more information. And it was just really fun to learn so much more about the company that you didn't even know. That's so that's incredible. Exciting. Well, it's been gone 54 years now, yeah. you know, but I think it's important to understand the history of our company in order to keep it healthy. Cause it's just, it's unusual. Mm-hmm. Any super creative yeah. company. And all the influences that come through. I mean, I didn't realize that Marty worked with Josh um, Wooden as close as he did. Yeah. And it, it's so weird again because there's another tie-in to my old life before Disney. I used to have Wooden in my restaurant every week. And we oh, would sit wow. and talk. And Sizzler? And like, yeah, it's Sizzler. <laughs> and so... He would always come in. He was always by himself. But we would sit and talk because, you know, the guys would always be talking about basketball and whatever. And getting his little nuggets of wisdom, but not realizing now tying it back into how he impacted somebody like Marty Scalar. You know, that's, yeah. it's surreal. You don't realize... Um, I'm telling Juan this. I mean, it's like I'm reading this book, and it's like, okay, I met Marty, but it was in the concept of work. So, 
it was like, no, I got to get Marty from point A to point B. Okay, yes. He's got his drinks. He's got his tour guide. He's got this. But you don't realize who it is at the time. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That he has so, a yeah. life and a history and a journey. Yeah, and it's amazing how long and how it started. And I can't wait to see where it goes. I think it's also interesting when they talk. He talks about John Hanchin. I don't know these guys as well as you probably do, Teresa, but these are all famous Imagineer guys. And he does mention that their best Disney park is, in fact, the Disneyland. Uh huh. Side of it, I want to tell you guys, I agree with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he helped on every Yeah. All right, Ron just got back. So um, I did. I'm going to say hi to Ron, everybody. Hi, Ron. Hello, Ron. <laughs> so we're Thanks for popping on, Tam. Yeah, and I'll talk to you guys later. Okay, hi. Right, see you. Bye. You know, you, were, you guys were talking about uh, how, like, Marty would just, you know, go to coffee here at the park, or Walt would go to coffee at the park. I was um, a GSM in Emporium, and I was opening one morning, and I was opening the doors to Fortuosity, which, you know, opened up on the Carnation. And right there at that corner booth was John Storbeck, um, Jack Linklist, who was our very first president, and Marty, and I opened the door and saw them, and I almost had a stroke. Like, they were having <laughs> breakfast. I, I'm fumbling with the door. I'm like, how does this latch go? And I don't know if you guys know Lois Foster. She's been, at, you know, like, bark 30 years. Little teeny lady. Uh, she comes over, and she says, do you need help? I said, oh, my God, yes. And, you know, <laughs> It was so funny, but I just like broke out in a sweat. It was crazy. But, and then oh, Walt used to encourage his, his, the folks that worked at the park to like go out and eat in the park, you know, experience mm -hmm. it as the guest experience it. And he would, you know, give him money to go to lunch. So crazy. Gosh, just such, such interesting history. It makes sense because before I read this book, I couldn't understand how younger kids didn't know Walt was a real person, but when he had that mentality of it's the it's the Walt Disney brand, I'm not Walt Disney anymore, it makes sense why there's so many young kids that don't believe that he was a real person because I think that may have been somewhere along the line, that may have been his goal. You know, maybe especially probably once, you know, Disney was a success and like Walt Disney Studios and everything was a success. He probably thought like, you know what, this this is its own thing now. I, it's not just me anymore. So it 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 made a lot more sense to me how there are people that don't know he was a real person. So like that opened my eyes. That's a really good point, Judy. I never thought about that, but you're right because he says that you know that Disney will live longer than I will, right? Yeah. I never yes. thought about it that way. Hmm. One of Marty's quotes that he talks about the leadership secrets, Walt was always looking for somebody to take a chance. I think that's so interesting because it, it, um, everything we do within our careers is a chance, but obviously like that's, uh, you know, that's something that Walt was always looking for people to do too. I think that's kind of cool. I think part of that probably has to do with passion. So people who are willing mm -hmm. to take that chance and they put themselves out there, it's something they're probably passionate about. And he followed passion because he knew if you're passionate about something, you're going to put the effort in and be successful in the long run. So that makes me think that it's probably because of passion. Yeah. Do you guys mind if I share a real quick reading on passion? That was like an amazing segment. It's a little long, but um... I mind. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> you're so okay. I know. <laughs> so Go there's a, um, I, let me, I'm trying to see who exactly was his on there. Mark Davis, one of, Disney greats in animation since the 1930s had a similar experience when he moved from the studio to Imagineering in the early 1960s. Although he made dozens of presentations to Walt in the course of creating some of the best known characters in Disney animation from Tinkerbell to Peter Pan to Cruella de Vil in 101 Dimensions and Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty, Mark was still nervous when he pitched his first storyboard sketches for a Disney park to show Walt. When Walt even thought did not respond immediately, Mark stepped in the void uh, Walt, I've got another idea for this, and it's a lot cheaper. Now, Walt responded quickly, putting a hand on Mark's shoulder and set the tone for how our Imagineers were to create for, were to create for the Disney parks. Walt, Mark, Mark, Walt said, I have a whole floor of finance people and accountants upstairs who are going to tell me the cheapest way to do something. What I pay you for is to tell me the best way. Mm -hmm. That's That, to me, is Disney. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Uh, which, is, which is why I think we were, you know, 
we made some mistakes with some of the things we did in DCA and how we course corrected back to making quality entertainment is what, where we mm-hmm. got back on track as a company. Absolutely. Cheaper is not always better. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And that's what Paris is doing right now. They're, um, Paris Disneyland has, I think, a $2.5 billion renovation that they're doing right now where they're fixing things that weren't exactly done right the first time because of money. Mm-hmm. So it, it, costs- it costs so much more to fix yes. if you don't do right in the first place. Exactly. Because yeah. I think, uh, I think it was $4 billion to fix DCA or something like that. And I mean, the whole park costs a billion to begin with. And it's like if you just spent the money. The first time. Yeah. 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 Finances are important, right, Teresa? Yeah, they pay. They pay our paycheck. It's definitely, you know, it's a, it's a bit, it's a balance, which is why it's important that you know we who are in the trenches um, not be afraid to voice what we think we're doing wrong or doing right, right? Yeah, it's just good to good to be aware. So for I was I was talking to Jesse about this, but um, we have from page sixty three, the beginning of chapter seven. To the end of chapter nine, 100, page 159, it's almost like 100 pages. So, That's long. Uh-huh. Wow. Should we do two chapters? <laughs> yeah, we should do we two chapters. You, you want to do two chapters? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that would help us a lot. Uh, it's less than, a lot less than 100 in that case. It's, um, Unless it's the, you know, the chapter with a million pictures, I think we should just do two chapters. <laughs> See, does, the one, there's one with chapter pictures, but it doesn't have a million pictures. It has a few sketches and such. Uh, they left me behind and went home is the one we'd be missing if we didn't. And something about IBM screwing up or something is one of the two chapters. <laughs> well, we have an extra chapter, so one week was going to be four instead of three. So then that gives us more wiggle room for if there's like mm-hmm. a three-chapter one that's really long, then we can shrink it down to two. There you go. You want to just use chapter seven and eight this week? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesse's the mathematician in the group. Yes. No. <laughs> no math was my bad subject. <laughs> I don't know about the rest oh, of it. It was mine too. So. <laughs> yeah. so seven and eight. Yeah. Cool. Well, the intimate group was, was a little more fun because we could, you know, not have to mute all of our microphones the whole time, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't it think we read out your faces. There, though, either, but I mean, it was a good place. Some good stuff. There's a ton of good stuff. I'm glad we're re-read, re-read, rereading it. Getting me all re-inspired. Oh, man. All right, so guys. Cute. Let me get more so than uh, three people <laughs> this week, okay? All righty. You guys have a great day. Okay. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye.